In this video, I'll be discussing predicting products based on a set of given reactants. All right, it's a pretty complicated process, so try and follow along. Uh, for instance, the first step here is identifying what reaction type we have. And so, if you can't identify the reaction type, you can't move forward in the process. And so, I'll, I'll go through the basic steps in this and how we can recognize these different types of reactions. But if you don't have this process down, sit down and review it and try and figure it out before you move on to the next step. All right, so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you what the reactants will look like for these different types of reactions. And so for instance, I say here if you have as reactants a hydrocarbon and oxygen, you should be able to identify hopefully that it's a combustion reaction because combustion reactions always have hydrocarbon plus oxygen and it yields carbon dioxide and water. Right. If it's a compound in an element, now there are a couple things it could be, but we're going to simplify it here and say, assume that that element is coming in, it's going to displace something within the compound, and then it's going to be a single displacement reaction. If it is just one compound on the reactant side, that compound is going to break down. All right, it, it's going to be a decomposition reaction. If we have element plus element, we're going to assume that these elements are going to come together and form something new, which we call a synthesis reaction. And then lastly, if you have compound plus compound, we're going to assume that they're going to just switch places with each other and we're going to get a double displacement reaction. So as I said, the first most basic step is that you're going to have to identify what sort of reaction we have. And based on that, uh, we can start to go through the process of predicting reactants. But if you can't identify it based on this system here, um, you can't move on. So make sure that you're pretty good with these, because as I go through the examples, uh, it's important that you do that as the first step. So I'm going to go through a couple examples here. For instance, if you have mercury 2 oxide, we have just one reactant here. So think to yourself for a second, if we have just one reactant, what type of reaction is it? All right, hopefully you came up with a decomposition reaction. And for decomposition, we're going to keep it pretty simple. We're going to say it's going to break into its elements. All right, so it's going to break into elemental mercury and elemental oxygen. Now, there's something to be careful of here because mercury is a monoatomic element, meaning when it breaks down, it's just mercury. However, there are seven diatomic elements. I give you the mnemonic device Honkelbrief, H O N. C, L, B, R, I, and F, Honkelbrief, to try and remember the seven diatomic elements. That's hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and fluorine. All right, those are diatomic elements, meaning if oxygen is by itself as it is here, it's in an elemental form, it's going to have O2 as, as the substance that it is. Mercury is not diatomic, so it's just Hg when it breaks into its elemental form. So there are only seven of the diatomic elements. Everything else, when it's breaking down under decomposition, uh, will be just individual atoms. But there are seven of them that will be diatomic. All right, the last step here is that we've got to balance it. Moving on to the next one, it says, let's say that we had benzene here, and oxygen is our react reactants. Uh, you see that C6H6 is a hydrocarbon. We also have oxygen involved. That should clue you into the fact that we are talking about a combustion reaction. All right. Notice here that oxygen, again, being a diatomic element, is O2. For a combustion reaction, it always has the same products. Hydrocarbon plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide and water. All right. And then, as a last step, we balance it. Next one here, you've got sodium and chlorine, something like this. Again, chlorine is a diatomic element, all right, so it's Cl2. If we've got sodium and chlorine coming together, that's element plus element, which means that it's a synthesis reaction. We're going to make something with sodium and chlorine in it. To figure out what we would make, you have to think what sodium and chlorine would mix to form. Sodium has a plus one charge, chlorine has a minus one charge, and so together they would make NaCl. All right. By the way, uh, this is a synthesis reaction. I think I mentioned it. Element plus element means it's synthesis. All right. So 
I'll go through a little bit more depth on this when I'm talking about the different processes. I'll go through 12 example problems. Uh, but basically here, we need to figure out if ever we have two elements coming together to make an, a new substance, we have to figure out how they would mix. Sodium and chlorine, Na plus, Cl minus, it's just one and one when you do the crisscross there, and so we get NaCl. All right, and then again, as the last step, you have to balance it. Lastly here, it says if we have magnesium chloride, magnesium chloride and lithium nitrate, which are these substances, what will we get? Well, this is compound plus compound, so it's a double displacement reaction. What we're going to do is we're going to switch kind of what's in front. So magnesium was, was with chlorine in the beginning, and lithium was with nitrate. All right, so in the end, lithium is going to end up with chlorine, and magnesium is going to end up with nitrate. Now, again, I'll go through and do some more in-depth example problems here in a minute, but magnesium, when it ends up with nitrate, doesn't end up just being MgNO3, all right, because magnesium has a 2 plus charge and nitrate has a 1 minus charge, okay, and lithium chloride, LiCl, it doesn't take both of those chlorines because when we have lithium and chlorine together, it's just, it's, it's LiCl, not LiCl2. And so you have to think about what substances would be made when these two things combine, and we use the charges to, to make that decision and then do this crisscross method, which as I said, you'll see here in a, a few examples in a moment. All right, and then as one last step here, we're going to balance the chemical equation. The last thing I'm going to talk about here is something that's called the activity series. This comes into play with single displacement reactions. So anytime you do a single displacement reaction, it's really important that you think about the activity series. Uh, and the idea here, as you can see, is that elements aren't all completely interchangeable. Some elements can't take the place of other elements. And so you look at this activity series, which is on the back of your periodic table. I'll pull up a picture of that now. You can see here up at the top, it says that it's an activity series of metals. All right, It's listed in terms of what, what has the highest activity. Something that is higher on this list can't displace something that's lower on this list. For instance, if we're comparing manganese and cobalt, if manganese came in as an element, it could displace cobalt. It could take the place of it. Cobalt, however, if it's trying to come in, it cannot displace manganese. All right, so things that are lower on this list cannot displace things that are higher on this list in a single displacement reaction. Something to consider. Also, uh, something to mention, is that hydrogen is listed here with the metals. That's because hydrogen often takes the place of a metal inside of an ionic substance. And so it's sort of strange, but uh, hydrogen, you know, if you look at the periodic table, it's listed with the alkali metals. It kind of acts like a metal in that, in that way too. And so hydrogen is weird, but it ends up being lumped in with the metals here. And then we have down at the bottom a very much smaller activity series for nonmetals. This is when a nonmetal tries to displace a nonmetal. It works exactly the same way. Something low on this list cannot displace something high on this list. So we will be using that as we go through our examples. Speaking of which, uh, here is the sheet that has the example problems that I will go through. Um, you should have a handout that looks like this, and the answers are all in the back of that handout. But I'll go through here and explain how this process works. So this one, uh, the first thing you have to identify is what sort of reaction we're dealing with. We've got sodium coming in, and it's reacting with iron bromide. All right, it's a single displacement reaction. If it is single displacement, we were just talking about this, you have to check the activity series. Sodium is coming in, it's trying to displace Fe. So what we do is we look at the activity series and we look at where sodium, are, where sodium is and where Fe is. Sodium is right here, Fe down below, all right? And so we see sodium is higher than Fe, which means sodium can displace iron. So going back to our problem here, we're going to have sodium displace iron, and sodium is going to end up then with the bromine. 
and the iron is going to come out on its own. By the way, I know that sodium is displacing iron and not bromine because sodium is a metal and iron is a metal. Bromine is a non-metal, so sodium is not going to displace the bromine. Sodium is going to displace the iron because metals displace metals, non-metals displace non-metals, with the exception, as I said, of hydrogen, which is displaced by metals. All right, so sodium's coming in here. It's going to displace this Fe. That means sodium is going to end up with bromine in the end. To figure out what it's going to make, we have to think of the charges. Sodium has a plus one charge. Bromine has a minus one charge. All right, those are on the back of your periodic table. Also, sodium is an alkali metal. Alkali metals are plus one. Bromine is a halogen. All halogens are minus one. Any way you remember it, any way you figure it out, plus one and minus one, and then we do this process where we crisscross and say, the, um, the charge becomes the subscript, and we see that it's just one and one. So when sodium and bromine come together in a new compound, it's going to make NaBr. All right, and then the other thing that we have here is elemental iron. Iron is not diatomic, so it's just Fe. As a last step, we need to balance this equation. So I'm going to get rid of some of this extra stuff. I notice for bromines, I have three bromines on the left-hand side, so I'm going to put a three here. So I have three bromines there. Now the sodiums are not correct, so I'm going to put a three here to get three sodiums. And that is now balanced. All right, problem number two, NaOH plus H2SO4, compound plus compound. This should tell you that we're dealing with a double displacement reaction. So sodium is going to switch places with hydrogen. That means that in the end, we're going to get sodium with sulfate. All right, so it's a double displacement. Sodium and hydrogen are switching places. We're going to get sodium ending up with sulfate. When we do that, we've got Na is a plus. Sulfate, SO4, is a 2 minus. And so when these come together, we get Na2 and then just one SO4. So one of the compounds we've got here is Na2SO4. The other one is going to ma be made of hydrogen and hydroxide. Now this is a little bit funny, but hydrogen has a plus one charge. You can find that on the back. Uh, it's also in the same column as the alkali metals. All right, hydroxide, OH minus, has a minus charge. All right, so it's one and one. And you might realize when you bring these together that they make HOH, which is just really H2O or water. So the other thing we get here is actually water. It's kind of strange, but it's a, a double displacement reaction and we end up with water. As a last step, we need to balance this. Looking around, you should see we just have to put a two here and a two here, all right, uh, to get the sodiums and the oxygens and hydrogens balanced there. Number three, C2H4O2 plus O2. All right, this one's a little bit strange because it's got oxygen in here, but hopefully you're recognizing this is a hydrocarbon fuel. All right, this is oxygen gas. So what we're dealing with here is a combustion reaction. All right, if it's a combustion reaction, we know what the products are going to be. It's going to be carbon dioxide and water. Start by balancing the carbons. So we end up with two here. Next, balance the hydrogens. We're going to have two here. Then you count the oxygens on both sides. There are six oxygens on the right, which means we need to make it so that there are six oxygens on the left. By putting a two here, we balance things out. Number four, there's only one reactant here. If there's only one reactant, that means it's decomposition. All right, if it's decomposition, it's going to break into the elements. All right, the elements here are nitrogen and hydrogen. However, nitrogen and hydrogen are both diatomic elements. 
All right, they're both listed in those seven Honkelbrief elements. And so when they break into the elements, it's going to be N2 and H2. Next, we need to balance it. We put a 2 here in front of the nitrogen, all right, uh, to balance NH4. So we've got two nitrogens on both sides. Now we've got eight hydrogens on the left side. So to make eight hydrogens on the right side, we put a 4 here, and that is done. Number five, PbSO4 plus AgNO3, compound plus compound. So you should identify that this one is double displacement. When we mix these together, all right, what's, we're going to switch places Pb with Ag. This one is a little bit trickier because we have to figure out what kind of Pb we have here. Because lead is one of those transition metals that can take on multiple possible charges. So we look at what it's paired with. SO4 is sulfate. Sulfate has a 2 minus charge, all right? There's only one lead here that balances out with it, so that means the lead has to have a 2 plus charge. So that means we're dealing with lead 2 here, all right? So Pb2 plus is the, is the kind of lead that we have here. So if that's the case, we're going to have lead with nitrate in the end, so Pb2 plus with nitrate. NO3 minus, all right, and we crisscross, we'll get two nitrates and one lead. So one thing here we get is Pb and then two nitrates, so NO3, two. All right, the other thing we get is a mixture of silver and sulfate. All right, so Ag is silver. If you look that up on the back, it's just a plus one charge always. Sulfur is SO4 2 minus. Doing the crisscross here, we get one sulfate, two silvers. So Ag2SO4 is what we end up with. Then we need to balance things out. To do that, all we really need to do is put a 2 in front of the AgNO3, and everything is good. For number 6, PBr3. So this one here, again, we've got a reaction where it's a decomposition reaction because there's only one reactant. If it's decomposition, we're going to see where it's just going to break down into the elements. All right, phosphorus is not diatomic, so it's just P. Bromine is diatomic, so plus Br2. All right, and then we have to balance it. We put a 2 here and a 3 here. That balances the bromines. All right, and then to get the phosphorus is balanced, we have a 2 there. Number 7, HBr plus Fe. So in this case, what we've got is we've got an element coming in in a compound, all right? So this is a single displacement reaction, uh, element plus compound. The iron is going to come in and try and displace the hydrogen. Because it's single displacement, we need to check, can iron displace hydrogen? So we find it here. Here's iron. Hydrogen is down a little bit lower. So Iron can, in fact, displace hydrogen, so we're good to go on this one. Something that makes it a little bit tricky is we don't know what kind of iron we have here because iron takes on a couple different, uh, different charges, and so we can end up with Fe2 or Fe3. You can choose either one. It doesn't really matter um, as long as you have one of them. So what we're going to get is... I'll, I'll do Fe2, for instance, all right, Fe2 plus, all right, and then it's going to combine with the bromine, which is Br minus, all right, if we do that and crisscross, we end up with FeBr2, and then as I said, you could have used the 3 plus charge of iron and you would have gotten FeBr3, uh, it doesn't matter, um, either one of those is possible. And then the other thing that we're going to have here is hydrogen was displaced, so we're going to get elemental hydrogen out of this. Elemental hydrogen is H2 because it's a diatomic element.
as a last step, you need to balance this. All we really need to do to get this balanced is put a 2 here, and everything is good. For number 8, KMnO4 plus ZnCl2, that's compound plus compound. So hopefully you recognize that is a double displacement reaction. All right, if it's double displacement, the, the fronts or the metals, you can consider them switching places. So K and zinc, potassium and zinc, are going to be switching places, which means potassium is going to end up with chlorine in the end. We've got K plus ending up with Cl minus. It's one and one. So one of the things we get here is KCl. The other pair is going to be zinc, which has a 2 plus charge, Zn2 plus, and that permanganate, MnO4, which just has a minus 1 charge. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to crisscross that, and we end up with 1 zinc and 2 permanganates, so plus Zn, and then we need parentheses because we have multiple of the polyatomic. MnO4, 2, and that's what we get there. All right, and then we have to balance this. To do that, uh, a couple options here. Um, balancing the chlorines, we can put a 2 here. Balancing the zincs. We would then put a 2 here. All right, balancing the MnO4s, we would need a 4 here and then a 4 here. Oh, and this has ended up in that weird situation um, where we have, I've done something strange and we end up having, just to clarify because this might happen for you sometimes, uh, some line of thinking ended up where everything here is doubled. It's a 4, a 2, a 4, and a 2. All right, and if you ever get that where they're all divisible by something, really you can reduce it down. All right, so I don't know what line of thinking led me to that. but um, So really it's a 2 and a 1, and a 2 and a 1 works out here. All right, and so that is what we have. All righty, so for the next step, um, number nine, again, this is compound plus compound. So it is a double displacement reaction. Some things here, uh, we've got four hydroxides attached to this tin. Hydroxides each have a charge of minus one, so four hydroxides have a charge of four minus. That means our tin has a charge of 4 plus. So we're dealing with tin 4 there. For the manganese, we've got two oxygens on it. Oxygens have a charge of minus 2. So this is going to be a 4 minus for two oxygens, which means we have manganese 4 plus in this case. Then uh, we can see what it's going to recombine to. If we've got manganese, Mn, Four plus, and that's now combining with the hydroxide, the end of the other one, OH minus. All right, crisscross, we end up four hydroxides, one manganese. All right, so what we've got here is MnOH4 plus, we've got SN4 plus, and the other ending is O2 minus. Crisscross, we end up with SN2O4, but then that reduces down because it's 2 and 4, so it's just SNO2. If you go ahead and look at this one, you should see that it doesn't need any coefficients added because it is already balanced. For number 10, oxygen plus C5H12O2. This is another one that it's kind of in a different order, but you should recognize that we've got a hydrocarbon here with some oxygens with it and an O2. So this is a combustion reaction actually here for number 10, which means the two products we're going to get are CO2 
and H2O. So if we've got that, then we just need to balance it. I would start, I usually start by balancing the carbons. We're going to leave oxygens till the end because oxygens are in everything. All right, so five here to balance the carbons. Then next I balance the hydrogens. Put a six there to balance the hydrogens. And then lastly, to get the O's right, I count it, I should have a seven here so that I have a total of 16 oxygens on each side. That was a combustion reaction, sorry. For 11, we have just one reactant here. If you have just one reactant, that means it's decomposition. If it's decomposition, it's going to break into its elements. That's hydrogen and oxygen. They're both diatomic elements, so it's H2 and O2. And this is another case where after you write it out, it's already balanced. For this last one, we've got SRO plus Mg. This is a single displacement reaction. If it is single displacement, all right, we've got to think, okay, the mag uh, magnesium is coming to displace the strontium. S so we look here at our activity series and we check can magnesium displace strontium magnesium is here strontium is here magnesium is trying to displace strontium because magnesium is lower on the list it can't displace strontium and so we end up with in this case a single displacement reaction that will not occur because magnesium cannot displace strontium and so we say no reaction will occur. All right, so uh, that is that. Hopefully that has helped you to understand this process of predicting products. It is pretty rigorous. There's a lot of different steps. And so if after watching this, you're still confused, make sure that you come in and ask.